me begin by uh, saying hello to everyone and thanking the organizers for inviting me to contribute uh, as the story of this work. Uh, this was done uh, in close collaboration with my colleagues at uh, Skoltech, which is Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology, a private university in Moscow. Uh, and uh, it's Eugene Statnik and Alexei Salimon in the Hierarchically Structured Materials Lab, and also uh, Igor Dobnia, who is the beamline scientist at uh, Diamond Synchrotron in the UK, in Oxfordshire, uh, and he works on B16 test beamline. Uh, the title is Combined Synchrotron Tomography and Diffraction Analysis of the Structure and Deformation of Ovine Rib Bone. Ovine comes from oven, uh, as in uh, lamb, in Latin, rather than ovum, which is uh, egg. Um, so we can say lamb rib bone for simplicity. And uh, the reason we chose to study this bone is because it's mammalian, it's, um, it has an interesting shape that I'll show to you, and it's easy to get it um, in the shops. Some of us like a uh, rack of lamb. Um, I've known colleagues in Singapore who liked uh, oysters and uh, chose to study uh, nacre and the mother of pearl. Uh, but um, my interest in uh, natural uh, mineralized tissues uh, has um, some history. I've been working on uh, human dental tissues and on bone for a while. Uh, and this is an extension of that interest. And today I wanted to uh, uh, cover this topic uh, in the style that I felt was appropriate for a summer school. I wanted to give people some uh, broader view, some background information, and uh, also uh, possibly to throw in some ideas that uh, some of the listeners might like to follow. I, uh, uh, there is a, a picture of uh, Frau Röntgen's hand, the wife of uh, uh, Konrad, and you can see in this uh, X-ray image uh, what x-rays can do. You can see clear contrast between um, uh, soft tissue uh, within the palm of the hand. You can see the structure of bones. Can you see my uh, uh, arrow, by the way? Yes, we can, we can. Okay, uh, this bulb here that looks dark is a ring on Frau Röntgen's hand. So you can see that the soft tissue ends somewhere here. Um, and uh, uh, that opened uh, a new era in uh, uh, medicine, but also in uh, uh, materials investigation. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, when Röntgen was asked what he thought when he made his discovery, he said, I didn't think I investigated. And indeed, this is one example of serendipity. Uh, Röntgen stored some photographic paper in um, light excluding uh, dark envelopes and nevertheless after running the x-ray tube shown on the right which produced um, um, something <clears throat> he discovered that they were exposed and thereby understood that it was some sort of penetrating radiation he didn't know exactly what it was so he called it radiation X and since then we call them x-rays so the uh, initial aspect uh, that was identified by Röntgen was the superior penetrating ability and the ability to obtain contrast um, in the image. And that contrast was associated with electron density. As we know now, um, X-rays are a type of uh, photons. So these are electromagnetic waves which propagate in packets and they uh, which we call photons, and uh, they are uh, they have um, associated uh, propagating electric and magnetic field, and these fields are sensitive to the electron clouds. So actually, the contrast that we get from X-ray radiographs is associated with the density of electrons within tissue. Now that is then linked to the Z number of atoms because the higher the Z number, the larger number of electrons is is uh, uh, orbiting around the atom. And um, we can use this to associate the radiograms with density. Uh, how is it used? This is an example of lung radiography. 
you can see the spine uh, column, you can see the vertebra, and then uh, you can see the ribs, and uh, also there is weaker contrast for the uh, soft tissue of the lung, and the reason for it is that it has lower density, lower Z numbers, uh, bones contain calcium and phosphorus, which are relatively heavier than uh, carbon, hydrogen, and uh, other uh, low Z materials contained in the soft tissue. But nevertheless, it's possible to identify arteries, atrium, uh, pulmonary trunk, uh, and other uh, features. Now, that is just a single projection. But since then, people have developed methods of obtaining three-dimensional pictures. Um, and that is done in a way illustrated here. This uh, ability has been put into context recently by the COVID-19 crisis. And you can see that um, this sequence of slices, as they're called, um, which are horizontal sections, um, virtual sections through the lung, show the structure very clearly at the same height. And you can see the development of the disease uh, from day five to day 15 to day 20. You can see this broken glass or, or foggy glass uh, damage that uh, occurs to the soft tissue. And one of the fundamental properties of x-rays that was identified concerns the tunability in the sense that by choosing x-rays of different um, uh, wavelength or different energy, you can selectively make them sensitive to uh, different densities and bring out the desired contrast. Um, now, how is it done practically? In practice, there are uh, a range of CT scanners. They uh, use either parallel uh, beam system, which is shown here on the bottom, in where, where you get a direct projection without divergence, or you can use a, a fan beam, which is a flat uh, section with a divergent uh, set of rays, or you can use a cone beam, in which case divergence from a point covers the whole sample. In all these cases, a key element of interpretation is uh, uh, the following. You rotate the source and the detector, in, as it is done in commercial and medical scanners, and keep the object uh, stationary, by virtue of which you obtain multiple projections. And then from this redundant data, using uh, uh, algorithms based on the radon transform, which was developed independently of this application in the beginning of the 20th century, and is akin and linked to Fourier transform, but uh, also sometimes is known as ray transform because it uh, interprets uh, what is obtained by ray projection. Uh, using that inverse radon transform and some associated filters, you can reconstruct the three-dimensional nature of the object. In synchrotron uh, setup, uh, you use a different uh, configuration. Typically, you use parallel beam. And your sample is rotated on a turntable. You obtain a set of projections and then use mathematical algorithms to obtain the three-dimensional picture, which you can then virtually slice in any way you like. I'm not going to dwell on the algorithms. It's enough to say that they are now sufficiently advanced so that you can just pick them off the shelf and use. Now let's talk about scattering. Again, about 100 years ago, um, now more, Peter Paul, Paul Peter Evold was uh, finishing his work on scattering uh, from organized uh, colloids or, or metacrystals, as they could be called. And he was talking to um, uh, Lauer, uh, Max von Lauer, not von at the time, just Max Lauer, uh, heard what uh, uh, Evold told him about uh, optical uh, visible light scattering from organized colloids and asked what would happen if the smaller wavelength could be used. Um, and uh, uh, Lauer turned to Röntgen, who was working in the same city, and asked him for help in experimentation. He was given uh, the help of Paul Knipping and Walter Friedrich at uh, the University, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. And uh, uh, they obtained uh, diffractograms using the following setup. This is the Röntgen tube, the same tube, which was still uh, relevant at the time. They had a screen. They put a crystal uh, on a goniometer, simple goniometer, and they had the photographic plate. And they got something like this. Not very impressive, you might say, but with some experimental refinement, they obtained this. And uh, it's a shatteringly 
meaningful and powerful discovery because what you see here is symmetry of crystal which you obtained using a microscopic setup you never resolved the fine scale of the crystal directly but nevertheless you can perceive its structure you can see that this crystal has a fourfold symmetry whereas this crystal uh, has threefold symmetry or rather it may even be the same crystal but in different orientation and crystallography the story of crystallography began uh, what we can get these days is illustrated here from some of our work about a decade ago where we looked at uh, commercially pure nickel you can see a very rich lower gram uh, which contains reflections which can all be indexed and associated with particular crystal planes and it gives us a plethora of information about crystal structure it gives us information about uh, unit cell dimensions about unit cell uh, symmetry, uh, how it, it, it is packed together, and also the arrangement of atoms within the unit cell. And this provided the foundation for uh, later uh, Nobel Prize discovery of the structure of DNA, perhaps the greatest uh, <clears throat> Nobel Prize of all time, because it revealed the secrets of life, and it uh, brought together physical sciences, methods, and biological applications. And um, <clears throat> it became possible also largely thanks to the work of Bragg's um, father and son, who received uh, the Nobel Prize in 1915. Um, they considered the conditions for constructive interference, which is actually similar to what uh, Lauer has done, but they provided a remarkably simple uh, rendition of the relationship between the following quantities. The lattice interplanar spacing, that is the distance between distinct planes in the crystal arrangement, the half angle of scattering, you can see that theta is half angle, the total scattering deflection is two theta, and the wavelength of the radiation lambda. And the simplicity and elegance of this equation continues to uh, impress us and serve us to this day. One of the things that it tells us is that um, there is an inverse relationship for a monochromatic uh, uh, source, if you fix lambda, um, between the angle and the uh, lattice spacing in simple terms, although there is a sign there, but in simple terms, the greater the spacing, the smaller the angle to keep this equation going, and vice versa, the smaller the, uh, the spacing, the larger the angle. And uh, which bit of that you cut out, you can choose, and I'll show it in the following uh, diagram. But uh, a further important contribution to this study, which we used in our investigation that I'm going to tell you about, was made by Peter Debye. And uh, the so-called debye Shara method is different from the Bragg method. And what it does is the following. If you imagine uh, placing a small polycrystalline sample in the center of this uh, diagram, then uh, diffraction or the, the beam uh, finds uh, sets of crystal planes of similar kind, of similar spacing uh, to diffract in different directions. So as a consequence, instead of a simple planar configuration that is typically used in Bragg geometry diffractometers, you create a whole cone of divergent scattered radiation. If you capture it with a two-dimensional detector, you have this family of circles known as the debye shara uh, circles. And uh, these circles contain a lot of information about texture, that is preferred orientation uh, and uh, structure and phase composition. And uh, uh, it turned to be particularly well suited to modern setup with a synchrotron beam and a two-dimensional detector, which can uh, capture the scattered radiation and convert it directly to images. Now, how do we select the radiation and the range of angles? This is a selection diagram that I've drawn. <clears throat> what it shows is the following. On the horizontal axis is Bragg angle. To repeat again, it's half of the scattering angle, so the maximum you can go is uh, 90. Uh, and um, uh, this 100, 180 gives you back scattering. And then you can imagine on this diagram that if vertically you set wavelength and horizontally you set the angle, then Bragg's equation shown here uh, appears as a sine uh, a quarter wave. Now, selecting the radiation tells you which section, horizontal section, you're making through this diagram. So for simplicity, I'm showing reflections from aluminum polycrystal with different Miller indices. The first one is 111, 20, 220, 311, etc. So for example, the 111 
will uh, the reflection will be identified as uh, having the scattering angle um, uh, corresponding uh, under copper radiation, for example, corresponding to the intersection between this horizontal line and this locus of this diagram. The next peak will appear at the next intersection and so on. Uh, why am I showing this? It shows that, in principle, uh, for the configuration that I showed before, for capturing many rings on the detector, you would prefer high energy. High energy means lower wavelength, and if you cut your diagram here, then all the scattering happens at low angle, and you can capture a lot of the rings onto the detector, and then it's just the business of making the detector as uh, well pixelated with large number of pixels as you can do, and then you'll capture a lot of information. Uh, high energy is also advantageous in terms of penetration. This shows X-ray attenuation length. And you see that for uh, material like aluminium, uh, if your photon energy is of the order of 1 keV or uh, let's take 8 keV, which is common uh, laboratory uh, copper source, your penetration is on the order of 10 microns, maybe 20, maybe 50 microns for aluminium. But if you wanted to penetrate larger volumes, you would push to higher energies. So let's say if you were at 100 uh, keV, you could get through uh, literally centimeters of aluminium and millimeters of heavier metals like titanium, nickel, and iron. And that has opened the way to uh, industrial radiography. People use uh, energies in sources up to 225, and then in um, dental x-rays up to 400 k kilovolts. And that allows you to uh, go through millimeters of um, dense stuff. Another uh, discovery or development that is worth mentioning here was made by Lawrence, who uh, first developed the cyclotron, which is a device for accelerating uh, uh, ions, uh, charged uh, particles. And uh, what uh, it used was a device like this, where an emitter, an ion source, uh, injected some ions into a magnetic field. Uh, that made them go around Larmor circle, and then you accelerated them in the gap with uh, pumping them by electric field, and then uh, made them turn again, and so on. And so as this acceleration proceeded, the orbit of the iron got, grow, grow, grew bigger and bigger, but ultimately it exited this magnetic field and uh, hit the target, and that was a way to study uh, nuclear reactions in particular. Uh, but uh, that uh, setup was relatively limited in its usefulness because the maximum energy, maximum performance that you could reach depended on the size of the area with magnetic field, and it got replaced with synchrotrons, which was the next generation of this idea. Now, synchrotrons can uh, accelerate electrons nearly to the speed of light, and that's important to know because that's the reason why they produce such uh, powerful and uh, parallel uh, x-rays that we use in our studies. Now, these are Nobel Prizes for uh, contributors, major, major contributors to the theory of relativity. The first one worth of mention is Lorentz. Einstein had to wait for a much longer time to get his um, uh, uh, Nobel Prize for services to theoretical physics. Uh, particularly for the photoelectric effect. There was not a word about relativity, but nevertheless, <clears throat> we remember him mostly for this. And uh, from basic equations of relativity that connect rest mass and total mass, we know that, for example, electrons at 600 giga electron volts, which is the energy to which you accelerate them at uh, synchrotrons such as ESRF, European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble, uh, their uh, speed uh, reaches this value uh, a fraction of the speed of light, so very fast. But the beam divergence simultaneously, which scales with the same relativistic factor here, uh, becomes extremely small. The reason for that is that in the lifetime of an electron flying almost with the speed of light, you uh, it, it experiences contraction of space uh, and is only able to emit radiation forward. Uh, into a very small uh, cone, and that gives us a very sharp parallel synchrotron beam. So let's uh, talk about how we use this. Uh, this is a, a device like a synchrotron, so differently from the cyclotron, it uh, uses a stationary tunnel. You don't need to cover all of this circle with magnetic field. You maintain magnetic field at carefully selected points through which electrons fly, and the strong magnetic field that you apply make them turn and remain on the path within the synchrotron. And occasionally you insert a device which uh, makes the electrons uh, go around the bend or wiggle, and that produces the radiation, the X-ray 
uh, beams that we want. Um, originally, that was also a parasitic effect. It was uh, <clears throat> a nuisance because uh, electrons accelerated in a device like that lost energy when they emitted X-rays and uh, had to be replenished. But uh, people discovered that they also produced these uh, fascinatingly strong beams, which are uh, many orders of magnitude more powerful than laboratory beams. And um, the way we use them for scattering that I already mentioned is the following. Uh, electrons arrive, they interact with the, sorry, photons arrive, they interact with the uh, uh, electron clouds around individual atoms. Uh, during that interaction, the re-emitted uh, X-ray uh, waves interfere. They interfere constructively in certain directions, which gives rise to the famous Bragg's law that I already mentioned. And uh, here on the detector, in the colored version, we observe the Bayshara rings. And uh, from looking at the radius of this ring and careful calibration, we can actually get very precise information about uh, distance between lattice planes. And if it changes, then it changes due to uh, strain that the material experiences or phase transformation uh, or temperature. And so we can study all of these uh, processes non-destructively uh, using X-rays as our probe. <clears throat> In a, a very fundamental summary uh, way, what we need to introduce here is the scattering vector, the size of which is uh, defined as 2 pi over d, where d is that spacing between scattering planes or potentially between other scattering objects, because as it turns out, objects do not need to be arranged into a crystal. In fact, any density variation gives rise to scattering. And if we rewrite Bragg's law uh, here, we get the expression 4 pi sine theta divided by lambda. So this space of Q of scattering vectors is called reciprocal space, whereas space of D is related to the real space. So where our objects are arranged in a certain regular or semi-ordered way in the real space, it gives rise to certain scattering patterns in the reciprocal space. And it turns out, rather ironically, that the relationship between these two spaces is uh, mathematically described by Fourier transform, which of course was developed a long time before all of this was understood, but nevertheless turned out to be precisely what nature does in these experiments. And so if we look at what information is available, from peak position we get information about uh, lattice spacing, from peak intensity we get information about uh, the propensity, the, 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 the likelihood of finding certain lattice spacing. And from peak line shapes, we get all sorts of information about size of crystallites and uh, uh, order disorder within them. Uh, now, this can be done in the wide angle, in which case we are sensitive to very uh, uh, short distances. Remember Bragg's law, wide angle, short distance, small angle, larger distance. So wide angle gives us information about crystal structures, small angle gives us information about nanostructures, super crystal structures. And uh, here is a range of Q values, and this is the corresponding range of um, uh, lattice spacing. So you see that uh, Q of the order of one in inverse angstroms gives you information about fractions of nanometers, whereas if you go to very small values of Q, you can potentially be sensitive even to microns. So what does it allow us to study? Well, pretty much everything. We can look at atomic structure, we can look at microstructure, uh, precipitates, porosity, polymer structure, viruses, proteins, uh, bacteria which are larger, and we overlap, which is very important, with optical and electron microscopy. So we've equipped ourselves, thanks to the efforts of all those scientists, with the ability to study very complex crystals, including proteins and uh, pharmaceuticals. We can look at gases, liquids, glasses, colloids, um, nanoparticles. And um, in more detailed discussion, you can focus on the form factor, which uh, talks about what uh, our material is composed of, and structure factor is uh, in terms of how they're organized. All of that is accessible to X-ray studies. And in fact, as I said, there is an overlap between scattering and imaging, and we can use this interplay to good effect. So this shows the comparison of different structure of polystyrene foams and the differences that are detectable on the small angle scattering diagram. Now let's talk about bone. Bone is a fascinating example of nature's hierarchical engineering. Uh, and uh, in this diagram, which is taken from the paper by uh, Rob Ritchie, 
uh, uh, we are looking at the organization from amino acids into tropocollagen and mineralized uh, collagen fibrils. So this is very important to understand. Collagen is a triple helix uh, long molecule, which is folded in, the, in a particular way. Uh, and it's basically one of the most common, most important organic fibers, which uh, hold uh, tissues together. Uh, skin, uh, internal organs, uh, bone, all contain large uh, volume fraction of collagen. But collagen is also uh, has the ability to incorporate mineral crystals. Mineral crystals that it incorporates into its structure and uh, essentially into leaves with them uh, that are used in the mammalian world are calcium uh, phosphate, also known as hydroxyapatite. It's a hydrated form of calcium phosphate. So it's basically brittle, chalk-like mineral, but nature manages to build out of it uh, pretty um, strong and hard uh, tissues such as teeth and bone, uh, which are not particularly fragile, as we know. Uh, and it's done by tying all of that uh, beauty together somehow, by tight incorporation between organic and inorganic phases and by this hierarchical arrangement. So we don't have large chunks, large pieces of chalk in our body. We have tiny nanocrystals of hydroxyapatite that are bound together and held together by collagen and then organized very carefully at different scales. And you can see it starts from nanometers to microns to millimeters uh, into arrays of fibrils containing hydroxyapatite, osteons, um, or canals for supply of nutrients uh, during bone growth and remodeling. And then you have uh, spongy or cancellous and compact or uh, cortical bone, uh, which is shown here. So the outer uh, skin of the bone is uh, dense and thick, and the uh, inner part of it is porous, and that's important for light weighting. And here is a diagram of uh, Haversian system of canals and uh, this collagen fibrous uh, structure with uh, hydroxyapatite around it. And this is an illustration of how bone grows by promoting osteoclasts cells that uh, destroy bone and osteoblasts which deposit a new bone structure. Now, an important uh, aspect for our study was the Meccano-Stutt hypothesis, um, first made by Julius Wolff who uh, postulated or surmised that uh, bone grows when it's needed, when it's loaded, um, uh, it strengthens under those conditions. And if you leave bone without growth, without loading, then it resorbs, i.e. Uh, gets removed by the metabolism. So the Meccano-Stat hypothesis uh, is, is very important and has been uh, demonstrated to hold in such studies as uh, Ilizaro's surgical ways of extending bones where the bone is broken and then held at a small gap which then uh, perceives the tension and uh, deposits a new bone and uh, in deformities bones can be extended by up to 10 centimeters by this uh, rather disruptive but very effective treatment but in our study we introduced the osteodyne hypothesis and that concerns something else whereas Wolf's mechanostat uh, hypothesis is related to macroscopic balance within bone. We're talking about osteodynamic equilibrium within bone, and particularly we were interested in the equilibrium between uh, collagen and uh, hydroxyapatite. Remember, hydroxyapatite is a brittle mineral, and even though it's uh, refined into nano uh, crystals, nevertheless, it doesn't like tension very much. And uh, a hypothesis that I put forward based on my study of dental tissues is that nature is very clever at engineering um, tissues and organs using um, uh, residual stress. In other words, it's to the advantage of uh, mineralized tissues to maintain hydroxyapatite in compression so that when the bone is subjected to tension, instead of immediately sensing tension, it just can go into less compression and maybe zero stress, but never really experience tension. And it's balanced by the collagen, which is very good and strong in bearing tension and deformable, that uh, starts out in tension, but can take large strain and, uh, and protect the bone from fracture. So that's what we wanted to look at. Uh, in fact, both of these hypotheses. And so here is some <clears throat> illustration of previous work. Our colleagues, uh, Stuart Stock and uh, John Almer at APS uh, Synchrotron in uh, Chicago in the States, uh, 
um, published a paper called uh, High Energy X-ray Scattering Tomography Applied to Bone, and I'll explain that a bit more. They used a rabbit uh, femur, they directed X-ray beam at it, they obtained a range of uh, device share rings, circles, <clears throat> and they interpreted it. And here is an example of what you get from a complex material such as bone. What you can see here is a number of rings. Um, this is a quarter of everything that you can collect, but uh, what is interesting is what is shown on the right, which is the conversion from this diagram to a diagram where horizontally you show despacing. That's by converting the radial position of the ring uh, using calibration. And vertically you show azimuth. The azimuthal angle is the angle that you, for example, can count from the vertical or from horizontal. And so going round the ring gives you 360 degrees. And we can see the variation of um, uh, intensity around the ring. And that variation uh, tells us about texture. This is particularly clear, for example, here. Uh, but uh, I would uh, like to say that radial variation is also related to texture and is also related to phase. So uh, just for memory, wax diffraction patterns contain Debye-Shara powder diffraction rings from groups of grains corresponding to certain Miller indices. We can identify this band converted from this ring with certain HKL and contains information about crystallographic phase, preferred crystal orientation, texture, and strain. So here are examples of our ovine bones. We prepared them by cleaning them, soaking them in, in formal, formaldehyde for a while, um, and then uh, bonded the ends into these uh, holders. Let me show you why. So you see here a device on which the bone is mounted. There is a translation device underneath, allowing us to move it right, left, uh, and, and uh, forward, backwards, and up and down. The system of laboratory coordinates is defined here. And uh, this uh, funny-shaped aluminum plate is there in order to put, be able to put on top a loading device. Now, what you can see here is the bone held in grips. And there is a bolt. The bolt contained uh, an end tip uh, made out of titanium. And uh, the radiogram on the bottom shows the bone uh, and, and uh, the end of the bolt. Uh, we used it as a load cell. Effectively, we used diffraction from the bolt in order to measure the, f the force that we apply to the bone. And you can see that the bone can be bent by applying this, um, uh, for, uh, screwing forward the, the, the thread. And then we have um, uh, deformation and the three-point bending to observe. And we know the load that we applied and, of course, the geometry. Now, to start with uh, tomography, this is a tomographic image of a slice across the bone, and you can see the so-called cortical bone or dense bone on the outside and the lightweighting uh, natural arrangement. On the inside, you see the cancellous bone, the porous bone, and you see the bone marrow. And in fact, if you look uh, carefully here, you can see the cells in bone marrow. This was done with a uh, vi vi visual resolution of a few microns. Uh, you can also see the canals uh, that I mentioned before very clearly here. Uh, you can see a, a crack that appeared in the bone, and by using image segmentation according to intensity, you can uh, obtain a plethora of information about the structure of the bone. But what interested us particularly was that the bone had a complex shape, and we needed to extract information about strain in the presence of geometric effects. Let me try to show you what I mean. So this was the bone, and we could pay, put an imaging detector, not showing here for tomography. We could also put close in a wide angle scattering detector for uh, crystal diffraction, and we could put further away, uh, several meters away, a small angle scattering, which we needed because small angle scattering gives us information about collagen. Uh, for information, the spacing of collagen uh, fiber period is about 64 nanometers, so we need to be in the nanometer range, and this is our small angle scattering pattern, and this ring, and this ring here, barely visible, and the third ring are from collagen. You can see the directional nature, and this is diffraction from the hydroxyapatite. So basically, we had access to both um, uh, mineral and uh, organic content, and we wanted to look at the interplay between those parts of the bone. Uh, and here is the issue that we had to deal with. If you imagine your beam travels through the bone and uh, penetrates it, as x-rays do, it will be particularly strongly scattered from the dense, for wax here, for wide angle scattering from the mineral, it will be strongly scattered from the front wall of the bone and then from the 
rear wall of the bone. Now, geometrically, if this scattering happens at approximately the same angle and the angle small uh, change by only a very small amount due to deformation, then the ring gets split. Instead of a single ring, we see two rings. Uh, I think I didn't include the images of this, but there is clear splitting, doubling of the ring on the diagram. And so that's something that we had to deal with. But luckily, it's relatively straightforward to work out from geometry where this comes from. In fact, uh, it is possible to do cleanly only if we first do X-ray tomography. And so the interest of this study is to tell you that we came up with a setup where we first used tomography to perceive the shape, the geometry of a complex natural object such as bone, and then we use that information from imaging in order to inform our scattering interpretation. So we use both modes of uh, X-ray interaction with uh, matter and benefit from it. So what did we see? We saw that if we look at the uh, position of the uh, ring on the detector and plot the uh, correspond it over on top of the uh, cross-sectional uh, slice of the bone, we see the splitting. The different colors dot cor dots correspond to different rings that we detected. So the one of the rings uh, follows the shape of the front wall of the bone and the other ring follows the shape of the rear part of the bone. But we can also, from tomography, we can work out the center of mass position of the wall, and we can do it with sufficient precision then to subtract the displacement of the ring on the detector due to the geometry from uh, what we actually measured. And what is left is displacement due to strain, right? So what happens is strain causes change in the lattice spacing that causes the change in the radius of the ring because of the change of angle. And ultimately, we were able to interpret it as uh, a diagram like this. So this is a diagram for one wall after subtraction of the shape. This is the diagram for another wall. I mean, the light blue and the, black, uh, and the black and the red represents the average between them. So there is some commonality between what they experience. And the question is, where does it come from? And we surmise that this comes, this looks like a bend, bending profile that you sometimes, if you do mechanical engineering, that you see in plastically bent beams. So what we think is what happens that this bone shown here, when it grows, uh, undergoes, in, experiences internal stresses and strains which are associated with growth. So as the bone grows, material gets deposited actively in the region of bone growth. Um, and particularly if the bone, as this one does, grows into a crooked, a bent shape, then there is more material deposited at one side than the other. When growth stops and the bone is matured, this, these internal stresses become re-equilibrated. And this is akin to the way a bent bar remembers plastic deformation. As a consequence, this diagram that I show here has a guide to the eye line, which shows a bent profile. And indeed, we see that the wax strain uh, follows this line. But here we were also able to extract suck strain. Now, there is a bit of an issue with suck strain. You can't interpret it directly because it doesn't directly correspond to the elastic strain experienced by the uh, material. And we've uh, managed to uh, understand the sources of this effect by looking very carefully at the nature of uh, small angle scattering from uh, uh, gradients of density. In simple terms, uh, small angle scattering is uh, sensitive and dependent on the internal gradients, whereas wide angle scattering uh, effectively perceives scattering centers, atoms and electron clouds as points. So for points, you have very clean Fourier transform. For uh, uh, smooth uh, gradient distributions, you get uh, the effect of the nature of those gradients on the scattering. Nevertheless, information can be extracted. Uh, we described it uh, in the study of uh, thermoplastic polyurethane in a paper published in Nature Communications in 2015 and have used that knowledge ever since. But here we're plotting uh, Sachs strain multiplied by a factor of four, which is typical. And you see that it 
co coincides, corresponds to the same shape that we see for hydroxyapatite largely, except for the central part of the bone. Now, to recall, the edges correspond to growth areas, the center corresponds to the core of the bone where there is less, and you see the gap. You see, indeed, that with respect to the hydroxyapatite that is in compression, the collagen that is the dominating the sac scattering is in tension. And this provides a very preliminary, a very tentative, but uh, um, yes, suggestive uh, confirmation agreement with the um, osteodyne hypothesis that we formulated. So, uh, this provides a repetition of what I said uh, in, in, in short uh, words, but this uh, suggests that the mechanostat hypothesis uh, can be seen as underlying the bent bar shape uh, and memory that is shown by the uh, uh, data, uh, and that <clears throat> the osteodyne hypothesis uh, again, might be gleaned. I mean, of course, it's one point or two points. It's not enough, and we will need to do more study. But if you think about it, it's not very easy to imagine how you can resolve these very fine-scale stre stresses that guide uh, uh, govern the interaction between uh, organic collagen uh, part and the um, uh, mineral. Um, that's the story. I hope you enjoyed following it.